As we've moved into the computer age, the technologies underlying payments have once again changed. Although currency was the dominant exchange technology for thousands of years, the advent of computers has drastically altered the economics of ledger-based payments. In general, two factors contribute to this primarily. One is the speed with which payments can be processed, and two is that the cost of processing each individual payment has declined dramatically. These two factors combine to create an explosion in the amount of payments that we have observed uh, in the last hundred or so years. Uh, <clears throat> if we were to benchmark the total volume of payments in 2020 versus 1920, even on a per capita basis, we would find that the number of individual payments per person has multiplied by at least a factor of five in that time. <laughs> Now, it's important to note that the cost structure related to computer-based payments has moved more towards fixed costs than variable costs, as a lot of the processing uh, technology can in fact be automated and taken away from the purview of human supervisors. But of course, verification is a very important part of these sorts of payment structures, as the sheer volume of transactions all but ensures that there will be some errors, whether this comes from the back finger problems, network failures, bad code, or even fraud. As a result, there are still a lot of humans involved in overseeing the various payment systems and maintaining the record key, uh, systems <clears throat> that are required in order to sustain them. So we haven't done away entirely with humans and they are still part of the very expensive variable costs associated with processing large transactions. It's worth noting though, that approximately 80% of the central banks around the world today are exploring the notion of what we would refer to in the modern world as a digital currency rather than simply moving on a ledger-based representations of paper currencies, we're moving back towards a full ledger-based system uh, <clears throat> where all of these payments don't necessarily have to be intermediated by paper. And so this is, means that it's worth looking more carefully at the economics of payment systems so that we can understand how we might be able to make better versions or how we might be able to contribute to ongoing discussions about the creations of digital currencies. All payment systems must deliver economically on two important features, clearing and settlement. Clearing is effectively all of the activities that happen on the bridge between commitment and settlement of a particular transaction. Settlement is strictly speaking, the point of legal discharge of the obligation, a point of non-reversibility in the transaction. That once we have reached settlement, the transaction has been completed. Uh, and is generally not overturned uh, for any reason. Now, of course, in a modern world of computers, some transactions can be reverted, but there is a legal transmission of authority over the underlying asset, which occurs at settlement. <clears throat> um, so whenever we are reversing any kind of trades or transactions due to some kind of disruption in a computerized payment system, uh, this can involve a change in the title of assets as well, which is why people are so loath to do so. Now, payment clearing, uh, the, all, the sum of steps between commitment and settlement uh, <clears throat> involves a number of sub-processes. There's reporting and monitoring that takes place, uh, risk margining, ensuring that there is sufficient amount of capital available to cover any potential defaults, whether <clears throat> intentional or accidental. Uh, we have to consider netting trades out into single positions. Uh, there are <clears throat> tasks associated with tax and fa payment failure handling. Uh, <clears throat> so. In order to simplify this, many payment systems, particularly electronic payment systems, use some kind of clearinghouse which facilitates transaction netting and centralizes all of the various clearing activities into an, the hands of a neutral third party. Now, also important to electronic payment systems is the notion of settlement. Because settlement is a point of legal obligational discharge, it usually takes place in a legally supervised setting in order to reduce the probability of conflict between the two parties to the transaction. And that means in practice that almost all settlements reach finality or almost all payments reach settlement and finality through the wholesale interbank networks. <clears throat> now, to give us a little bit of ideas about how we might move further along this and consider techniques for improving digital currencies or even building new ones, I'd encourage you to consider the underlying principles that the Bank for International Settlements uh, describes on the link uh, in this particular <clears throat> set of slides, which identifies some core principles that central banks ought to be trying to adopt regarding new payment systems 
uh, that they supervise or are hoping to implement. Now, as I mentioned, all of these kinds of payments in order to effectuate legal settlement must clear over a legally recognized network. Uh, and these are typically what we refer to as backbone networks. While each individual country tends to maintain its own internal backbone networks and payment systems, we do have international networks that facilitate cross-border payments. The largest of these is what we call the SWIFT network. Uh, SWIFT is a network of banking institutions, approximately 11,000 of them operating in 200 countries around the world. Uh, they move money between them through uh, accounts in correspondent banks. So when you send money from, say, Canada to France, what will end up happening is the Canadian banker that you ask to send money will move the money at their correspondent account the French bank that participates in SWIFT, enabling the French bank to complete the payment for them and then simply settling up between them using the SWIFT network to adjudicate any differences <clears throat> uh, once all of the payments back and forth have been netted. Now, of course, the SWIFT system, as I mentioned earlier, can still be defrauded. North Korean hackers succeeded in robbing the Bangladesh Central Bank of $80 million by using a spoof of the SWIFT system. So it's not impervious to fraud. Uh, interestingly enough, China has launched a competing backbone, international backbone system called CHIPS, or the Cross-Border Interbank Payment System. Uh, this was initiated in 2015, and even though it doesn't have nearly the footprint of SWIFT yet, uh, this is simply a matter of time, in my opinion. This, the CHIPS system is, on, or SIP system, is only five years old, and adoption continues to grow. Now, within Canada, our backbone system within the country uh, is what we refer to as the organization that manages it is called Payments Canada. Our backbone systems uh, involve the use of things like the large value transfer system, uh, which enables institutions to connect directly with one another. But we also have things like the Automated Clearing and Settlement System, or the ACSS, which clears most of our internet banking transactions, bill payments, etc. <clears throat> Now, there is a new innovation coming in Canada's pipeline in 2022. Uh, we'll be introducing a new real-time growth settlement system called Real-Time Rail, uh, which we expect to significantly revolutionize and facilitate payments in Canada. No longer will there be substantial holds in payments between consumers, and we should have instantaneous transfer of uh, wealth over our shared ledgers as a result. Now, what most people think of as new or digital payment systems are not, in fact, new payment systems. They're GUIs. They're basically clothing that we put on the interbanking, uh, the international banking system in order to make the user interface more comfortable for consumers. Uh, companies like Venmo and Alipay uh, have effectively created a significant amount of value by simply repackaging the banking system to improve its appearance, its security, its integration with other platforms, and to improve the usability of it for individual consumers as opposed to <clears throat> a network which was originally designed for interbank transfers. Now, the big change in the digital payment space in the last 20 years has been the spread of smartphones, uh, which provides customers with a personal transaction in we're no longer limited by things like ATMs or having to go to a bank branch in order to pay our bills. We don't even have to necessarily go home and log on to our PCs. Now I can pay my bills, and in fact, I can buy stocks, bonds, and other kinds of financial securities, and even buy insurance over my smartphone during my commute. <laughs> now, it's worth noting that <clears throat> despite the improvements that we see in user interface that come from these kinds of companies, um, there is always the concern about the weakest link in the chain. It ultimately comes down to the physical infrastructure in a number of countries, which can be problematic. Problems like intermittent access to electricity <clears throat> or uh, weak cell signals that can prevent data from being transferred um, <clears throat> over wireless networks can really slow down payments and impede coordination ultimately, uh, regardless of how good the device or the interface might be for the consumer and regardless of how strong the backbone and this has led to a number of interesting problems uh, in a variety of countries around the world which have weakness in their physical infrastructure of payments. We'll be talking a little bit more about those kind of difficulties when we address banking in the next series of videos, or two series of videos from now, actually. Now, one of the advantages of mobile payments, um, has, which has significantly improved the interface, is its ability to use biometric information to identify the senders and receivers of funds. 
uh, which makes it much, much harder to spoof effectively than say a stolen credit card or a forged signature check. So as a useful point of reference, I think it's useful for us to have a look at how the global payments environment is expected to change. The World Pay Global Payments Report from 2018 uh, provided us with some interesting benchmark information, not only of how things were uh, being done at the time, but also how they were expected to change over the coming half decade. And so we can see side-by-side -side comparisons here of e-commerce payments and point-of-sale payments uh, and the forecast <clears throat> for how these different payment systems are expected to change. First thing to note uh, is that given this forecast over the next five years, you can still see how among payment systems that cash is still going to be a rather important component. While it used to represent 31% of payments in 2008 at point of sale, it's expected to decline to 17%. Now, while that might encourage some tech journalists to call for the imminent demise of cash, one should expect that cash will continue to hang on for an extraordinarily long period of time due to the anonymity that it provides. Unless there is a forced transition away from it, one can reasonably expect that we'll see <clears throat> uh, cash still being in use for a number of years to come. Another important trend to recognize is that credit cards uh, are expected to have to fight a lot harder to maintain their share of payments. You'll notice here that credit cards uh, are expected to face significant challenges, in particular from e-wallets uh, in the coming years. And e-wallets seem to be the, the type of payment that people are adopting, which cannibalizes the other techniques that they had previously used. So this is definitely an area that's attracted a lot of consumer attention. And if we were to carefully consider all the various <clears throat> subsystems that are involved in clearing of payments, or in, uh, think about the ways that we can improve the user interface, there may be substantial opportunities to create even more value for the various users of payment systems.